Let's continue. The adventure ends when one of the penitents strikes our Hidalgo and poor Don Quixote wilted to the ground. The narrator describes the encounter between Don Quixote and the Virgin as if a war were about to break out. The penitents see the crossbows of the Holy Brotherhood and forming a whirling shield around the image, they braced for an assault with determination to defend themselves and even to damage their assailants if they could. Violence is only avoided thanks to a fortuitous recognition. The priest was recognized by another priest who was in the procession, and their recognition calmed the apprehensions that had grown in both squadrons. Meanwhile, Sancho, thinking his master is dead, lets loose the most painful and laughable lamentation. His cries are hilarious and exaggerated, especially when he inverts the famous heroic phrase of Virgil, O oh, meek to the proud and proud to the wretched. Sancho's phrase also represents a confused allusion to Matthew, chapter 23, verse 12. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The same one cited by Don Quixote when the Micomicon adventure resumed in chapter 46. Next, confirming his status as an anti-hero, the arrogant Hidalgo regains consciousness and gets back into the cart. In a materialistic touch, the priest pays the officers what was still owed them, and moments later, the party continues its journey. The novel's final scene is truly pathetic. It's a Sunday when Don Quixote's cage enters the plaza of a village in La Mancha. His neighbors are amazed by the spectacle. Now characterized as a kind of scapegoat, Don Quixote is the antithesis of the virgin worshipped by the penitents. When he enters his home, the housekeeper and the niece undress him and get him into bed. And there were renewed the curses of the romances of chivalry. Perhaps the most curious aspect of the conclusion is the conversation between Sancho and his wife, Juana, or is she called Mari Gutierrez, or Teresa. In any case, she raises many questions. The first thing she asked was if the ass was all right. Sancho replied that he was in better shape than his master. Juana persists. Now, tell me, my friend, what good have you brought back from all your squiring? What new overskirt did you bring me? How about some nice shoes for your children? Sancho's response hints at the 100 escudos he stole from Cardenio. I bring nothing of that sort, wife of mine, although I do bring other more valuable things worthy of consideration. When Sancho fantasizes about going on yet another adventure to become governor of an island, Juana doesn't understand and asks for an explanation. This causes Sancho to urge her to be silent, using a refrain about an ass. Honey is not for the mouth of an ass. Eventually, Sancho can't take it anymore. It's sufficient that what I say is true, so shut your mouth. Sancho knows from experience that his chivalric adventures have been lucrative. Crossing mountain peaks, visiting castles, staying at ends whenever one wants, and all without paying the devil a penny for anything. The novel closes with two historical details. First, the narrator allows for the possibility of a continuation when he mentions the rumor that the third time Don Quixote left home, he went to Zaragoza where he participated in the famous jousts that were held in that city. This alludes to Zaragoza's fraternal order of St. George, which still held jousting tournaments in the early 17th century for the Aragonese nobility. Second, the narrator mentions a certain lead box discovered in the demolished foundations of an ancient shrine undergoing renovations, which contained poetic verses in the form of epitaphs and eulogies dedicated to Don Quixote Sancho Rocinante and Dulcinea del Toboso. This alludes to the historical controversy of the apocryphal books of Sacromonte unearthed in the city of Granada between 1588 and 1599, which contained an image of the Virgin along with a series of dubious texts written in Arabic and Latin. These were interpreted as the fifth gospel, 
and they were supposed to be proof of St. Mary's ancient protection of the Morisco population. The idea was to reconcile Christians and Moriscos in the years following the bloody Albujarras Rebellion of 1568 to 1571. The lead box at the end of the 1605 novel is a comic and ironic touch, but it also adds poignancy to the fact that Cervantes associates the final poems dedicated to his heroes with the pro-Morisco movement, which sought desperately to avoid the looming expulsion. And the allusion to the Morisco's fragile situation adds a tender context to the narrator's final request. He asks his readers for no other reward for his efforts except that they give him the same credit that judicious readers usually afford to the books of chivalry, which are so highly esteemed in the world. With this, he will consider himself well paid and satisfied and encouraged to seek out and publish other histories. If not as true as this one, then at least as inventive and entertaining. We have seen much debate about the books of chivalry and the only judicious or logical readers who vindicate them, despite all their imperfections and despite the priest's desire to burn them like an evil sect and the canon's urge to banish them like useless people, are the innkeeper and Don Quixote himself. Like them, at least here, more than anything, the narrator seems to be pleading for tolerance. <laughs>